So thank you very much to the organizers, uh, particularly Luis, uh, Diana, and Laura for having me and Marcella. Uh, what I want to do today is to, uh, we'll try to use the mouse, to give you an idea of one of the projects going on in my lab, which deals with the uh, control of the propanoids and phenolic compounds in general. Um, I don't think that this audience in particular needs any introduction to the importance of phenolic compounds in plants, but let me just remind you that not only there are uh, beautiful pigments, I mean, most of the flowers uh, that we see pigmented, that are starting to be pigmented right now, are actually due to phenolics, uh, but also very important in providing uh, cross-linking in the cell walls, uh, providing UVB protection, uh, providing a number of allochemical uh, interactions uh, between plants as well as between plants and microbes. Um, of course, the role of lignin in uh, transport and support is obvious to all of us. Uh, protection against a number of different pathogens, and I believe that Paula Casati will be talking more about this particular role of love nuts tomorrow. And finally, in the germination of pollen in maize and a number of other plants. Uh, now, keeping with the tone of the, of, the, of, the, um, of the conference, I want to remind you also the very important <coughs> bio, biotechnological applications that phenolics have. Uh, it doesn't matter really if you're trying to make uh, plants for more cellulose or for easier to obtain cellulose, or if you're trying to make plants for more energy, uh, ultimately you will have to work with lignin in one way or another. Here you're going to try to reduce it and make uh, the plants uh, less recalcitrant to cellulose extraction. We will, will want to increase it as a way to increase the biomass as well as the energetic potential if you decide to burn the plants or use lignin for any of the other applications that it has. So understanding phenolics is really important. We understand quite a bit about the pathway um, uh, from a number of different systems, uh, numbers are of the and poplar, but also from maize and other grasses. We know, I'm not going to go much into the chemistry, but we do know that the phenolics derive from, <coughs> from the shikimate pathway uh, into a tyrosine or feminine, depending on which species you're talking about. And then afterwards, you get some branching points uh, that you can send it in either into the phenolic acids, into the phenylpropanoids, and ultimately lignin, or into the flavonoids. Uh, part of my research deals with the synthesis of anthocyanins and other flavonoids, and how they make it into the vacuole. I'm not going to be talking about the, uh, that today. The big challenge in the field still is how is it that the propanoids can actually make it into the cell wall. Okay, we do understand how to synthesize. They're probably being synthesized on the cytoplasmic surface of the ER, but in the tablo, but there is absolutely no understanding of how the phenylpropanoid precursors or the ligand precursors can actually make it into the cell wall once they're synthesized. We do understand quite a bit about the regulation, and this is going to be the main topic of my, of my talk today, uh, in, uh, particularly in Arabidopsis, uh, where you can actually find networks of transcription factors impacting uh, the synthesis of uh, many phenylpropanoids. But the, uh, the idea in maize today is uh, that perhaps what has been learned in Arabidopsis is only of partial utility. Uh, efforts that have been made in taking some of the Arabidopsis regulators and putting them into maize or grasses have often failed. Uh, and this is probably has to do with the different type of uh, cell wall structures that monocots and dicots have, and the different functions of phenolics are playing in the two, uh, in the two uh, large group of flowering plants. So one of the things I'm going to be focusing on today is what, can we, what tools can we develop and what have we learned about the control of um, uh, phenolic compounds in general in maize and other grasses. Um, I put this here just to put this in the context of a number of other efforts that we're doing into what I like to, look, to call uh, comparative regulatory genomics. In maize, we're very fortunate that we have a number of uh, agronomically important cousins, uh, such as, for example, uh, rice or uh, sorghum, and also some other biofuel crops, such as sugar cane, uh, miscanthus, and uh, switchgrass. And we, uh, most of the work that I'm going to be telling you today deals with maize. I think you will very quickly be able to see how much of this can be translated to some of these other grasses. And in that regard, I do, uh, much of my talk today is going to deal with experiments that have been done in collaboration with a group in the Zephobi of uh, Paula Casati and Lorena uh, Falcone Ferreira. And uh, I'm not going to be mentioned, but we also have a collaboration going on uh, with a group of uh, Paula Mazzafera and Glaucia Sosa, 
uh, at Unicamp and uh, University of Sao Paulo, respectively. So, let me make a little bit of a, of a detour and tell you how we think about gene regulatory grids. Okay? You can imagine that a plant cell is completely wired by these interactions between transcription factors and the corresponding genes. And this, somehow, how these interactions happen and when they happen, result in which genes are being expressed at any given time. So if we want to understand those grids, and we think of grids as kind of a static representations of all the possible interactions that can happen in the plant, the first thing that needs to be done is to be able to identify the components. And the key components in these gene regulatory grids are, of course, the transcription factors, as well as the promoter elements to which those transcription factors presumably will be able to bind. So the first part of my talk, I will be, I will be telling you about the efforts that we've been putting into trying to identify these components in maize. Once you have the components, you want to see who interacts with who. Okay? And there are a number of tools that have been used. Uh, I'm going to be mentioning two of the tools that we're using in my lab, uh, chromatin amplification and the yeast one hybrid system. And that essentially gives you partnerships between the transcription factor and one or many other uh, target genes. Knowing the interaction doesn't really tell you what is the consequence on gene expression. So the next step is to be able to see what is the effect on the expression of the gene of that interaction. Is it activating transcription? Is it repressing transcription? Or maybe it's not doing uh, anything, just waiting for something uh, to happen. And ultimately, you can take all this information together and start building these uh, regulatory motifs that ultimately correspond to the building blocks of the entire gene regulatory grid. Okay? Once you do that, what you will often find is that you have gaps, you still need to identify some components, and then you go back to square one and start again and try to fill in those components uh, again. So, getting the, the parts, this is mostly transcription factors and uh, regulatory regions of genes. Um, in maize, there are about, like in any other plant actually, there are about 5 to 7 percent of all the genes correspond to transcription factors. And we're defining transcription factors here for the purpose of my talk as proteins that can bind DNA in a sequence specific fashion. Okay? We all know that there are a number of other proteins that participate in a regulatory complex. We're calling those core regulators. Uh, most of the time they're being recruited through protein-protein interactions and not necessarily by direct binding to the DNA. So from those transcription factors in maize, uh, about one half of those we know something about, the other half we know absolutely nothing. So we saw that one uh, essential tool that we needed in maize to start with was to be able to create a collection of all those transcription factors in a recombination-ready vector that can be easily deployed into any other vector that you wanted in order to be able to do experiments in planta or do experiments in yeast. So we started by building what we call the maize cure form. Uh, this is a collection of about uh, 2,200 transcription factors uh, of maize and corresponds just with your brain frame in a recombination ready vector. So this is how we're using the gateway system for this. Um, this collection is publicly available. We started by depositing everything into Agi. Some of you may be familiar with Agi. Agi at some point said enough is enough. We've got too many constructs from you guys. So we deposited the whole collection back into the AVFC, the Office Biological Resource Center, from where you have all of it. Um, most of these transcription factors actually came from either full-length CDNAs that have been cloned by the Arizona uh, Genome Institute, but we had to synthesize about 25% in all because there was no evidence of expression or there was no, uh, no available CDNA from which we could amplify them. The next challenge that we noticed is that even though we have a maize genome that has been sequenced and published like six or seven years ago, uh, annotation of the genome sucks. Um, in reality, we really don't know much about where transcription of uh, almost uh, any genes really uh, starts. In many cases, what you find is that ATG, the start of translation, is marked as the, trans uh, the, the, uh, the transcription start site. So what we decided to do then was to take an approach to map trans transcription start size in maize, and the way, we, uh, the way we did this was by using CAGE, which is a uh, cap-based um, um, analysis of the five prime regions of messenger RNAs. Okay? Mm -hmm. So essentially you capture the cap, and then you sequence the very, very five prime end of messenger RNAs. And in that way you get a number of reads corresponding to the five prime end. Once you align into the genome, you can map where the transcription start size for particular genes. So we've done this, I'm just showing you here one example. This is a gene that was cloned back in the 80s, and it's just to highlight 
of course, the annotation of MHNMS in case you want to rely directly into that. This is a gene for which uh, race PCR has actually been done in, uh, back in 87, and the transcription start site is right here. Nevertheless, if you go to the latest annotation of the main genome, it is shifted by about 50 days per story to 5 per minute. No evidence for that. Our cache data puts us perfectly where it has been mapped by um, uh, race PCR. So uh, be careful with the annotations. Um, when we did this, we were able to identify transcription start sites for about 40,000 uh, mRNAs corresponding to about 20,000 genes. And we found a number of things that were interesting and that we're continuing to uh, investigate. So in most organism characterized today, what you see is that the transcription start site is not precise. There is not just a single place where the messenger starts, but rather there is a region. And depending on how broad that region is, you can call a core promoter or transcription start site uh, focused or peak or broad. Okay? Um, in the analysis that have been done in Cialians, in Drosophida, as well as in Arabidopsis, what is obvious is that most of the transcripts, or most of the core promoters, are actually broad. What we found in Mainz is that the vast majority of the transcripts, the transcription start sites, are actually peaked. And that puzzled us for a bit, and we were thinking, what is going on? So we have reanalyzed everything that is available in the mouse uh, um, uh, cage analysis. And what we found is that mouse also seems to have a uh, high preponderance of peak uh, KSSs. So what we're thinking right now, and we don't have a model to explain it, is that it is actually driven by genome size. And big genomes are somehow, in some ways, using more big promoters for smaller genomes in which there are less transposable elements they're probably using much more often our broader promoters. And we're trying to see if we can find some history marks or some other characteristics in there, in the chromatin of the DNA, that will actually tell us what is making the difference. Um, the other thing that we found quite often, and there was also a surprise, is that very often, so we did this experiment using two embryo lines, uh, B73, which is the one that had been sequenced, as well as Missouri 17, and then we did both in the roots as well as the shoots. Okay, so all the data that I'm showing you is actually a, a, a summary, bringing all those four um, cases together. But we found many instances in which transcription structures were actually different between the roots and the shoots in either B73 or Missouri 17. And in few instances, those different transcription start sites actually gave different proteins. And I'm just showing you here two examples of cases in which the protein coming from the root is significantly shorter than the protein coming from the shoot. And in both instances, this corresponds to uh, the region that is different in the protein corresponds to a single peptide going for the, for the chloroplast. Uh, suggesting that one other way in which you can control where your protein will be going is <coughs> whether transcription is happening before or after the ATG corresponding to the signal factor sending to, uh, to plastic, for example. And this is interesting, we're trying to understand the relevance and how spread this uh, phenomena is in other plants for this very same genes. Okay, so now we have the pieces, we have the promoters, we know the way the transcription structures are, are in maize at least for 20,000 genes. We have all the transcription factors, all this information is integrated into knowledge base that we have in the lab. That's called Gracias. Gracias contains data not just for maize, but also for sorghum, sugarcane rice, I think it has particulium, and citaria right now as well. Um, so if you're ever curious about what are all the transcription factors, uh, you can download all the data from Gracias directly. Uh, you can send an email. So the next step is how to identify the interactions. And there are two main approaches for that. The gene-centered approach, you use it when you have, for example, a particular gene, take a uh, PAL in the uh, uh, phenolic pathway, okay, uh, and you have no idea who is controlling it. And there, the main approach for using that is uh, use one type of approaches. The other approach that I'm going to be uh, talking about is one in which you know the transcription factors, but you have absolutely no idea what genes those transcription factors are controlling. So if we, if we, if we take a look at the um, uh, transcription factor center approach, uh, there are multiple ways or multiple approaches that you can combine to try to get an idea of what are the targets of a particular transcription factor. But the one that is uh, most widely used today is uh, chromatin amino precipitation. And uh, for those of you that are not familiar with chromatin amino precipitation, it's essentially based on freezing the interactions between transcription factors and the DNA in the tissue where they're happening by using formaldehyde. And then once you extract the chromatin, break it up into pieces, you immunoprecipitate 
the complex of the DNA with the, with the protein with the antibodies against the transcription factor. And after releasing the cross-linking, you sequence, for example, all the pieces of DNA that brought down the antibody. And that gives you a very good idea of all the complex sites in the genome where your transcription factor was binding in a particular um, condition, in a particular tissue in vivo. Okay? So we have, we have applied uh, ChIP-seq um, uh, to uh, a number of different transcription factors. I'm showing you here a couple of examples. We have about five more in the pipeline in maize right now. We have also done it in Arabidopsis. It's a really powerful tool, but it has a number of calluses. Um, the one I'm going to be focusing about is uh, this gene over here, which is P1. It is a gene that has been known in maize for over uh, 100 years, and it essentially specifies, let me see if I have a picture, specifies the pigmentation in the terica, which is the outermost uh, layer of the maize kernel. Okay? So we knew from genetics and from uh, molecular studies that what it does is to control a branch of the plasma by synthetic pathway, which is shown here in the upper part of the slide there. Uh, but we also know that P1 is very important for controlling some insecticidal compounds that accumulate in the cells of maize. And in fact, P1 was mapped as the major PTL responsible for providing um, uh, resistance to the corn earworm, uh, which is one of the worst pathogens of, the, of corn in the Americas. And the reason for the resistance is the control of P of this group of compounds called maize, which are C glycosyl flavones. And C glycosyl flavones are really interesting compounds. They're derived from the flavonoid pathway, and I think uh, today you've heard quite a few talks about flavonoids. But rather than having the normal modification of an OH group in which you put a sugar, in this particular case, it is a carbon carbon bond that's been generated between <coughs> the flavonoid backbone and the sugar backbone. And that's shown to you. So the type of uh, um, uh, glycosyl transferase is responsible for making this sort of connection remain largely uncharacterized. And then you can see that there are a number of other modifications that characterize the structure of mason. So why is it interesting to uh, understand a little bit better about this pathway? And what I'm showing you here is the chemistry of this branch of the pathway in maize. <coughs> you can see that this compost has a lot of uh, importance, not just for the plant, but also for human health. And in fact, Many of the intermediates in this pathway are very important anti-inflammatory and anti-tumor uh, compounds. And uh, we have a collaboration going on with colleagues in the medical school, and we have started to characterize direct targets in humans, in particular human tumors, for the, um, the proteins that these factors or these compounds are binding. From the perspective of the plant, you can see that some of these compounds in this, uh, in this pathway are also important for inhibiting pre-harvest germination as insecticidal compounds, as the group of uh, uh, polar Casati has shown, they are also very important uh, UVB protecting um, uh, compounds. So, from a plant perspective, it's really important to be making uh, these compounds. But the problem is that we know quite little about the pathway. So, what we did was to take our knowledge of pathways, of, sorry, of, the, of lines, isogenic lines that express P or did not express P, and then combine chip seek with antibodies against P1 protein and uh, RNA-seq conducted between the contrasting lines to try to see what are all the target genes that P1 is controlling. And this is an excellent example of kind of a TF-centered approach to identify a, a portion of that gene load to a grid. Okay? Just, uh, this is not going to be the topic of my talk, so I'm just giving you kind of an idea that the overlap between ChIP-seq and RNA-seq is usually quite modest. It's usually a few percentage. Uh, you can explain that in many different ways. Uh, RNA-seq, of course, identifies both direct as well as indirect targets, but ChIP-seq only gives you the direct targets. But not surprisingly, many of the genes controlled, directly controlled by P1, were involved in flower by synthesis. One of the genes that we found in here, this is work that was done uh, particularly in collaboration with uh, Lorena falcon Ferreira, was a gene corresponding to cytokine P450, which we expected to be the first step in the conversion of flavonones to flavones. And it turns out that this is, and the way in which these experiments were done is by taking the dicyclone P450, which is very well regulated by P1, <coughs> putting it into the yeast strain that contains uh, the flavonone P450 redactase, that's the 111 strain, and then feeding the yeast with the precursors in the pathway, the precursors of this enzyme, uh, either arrangement or aridecule, uh, and then seeing the formation of the corresponding flavone. Making a long story short, this was not a bona fide 
flavon synthase, but rather it's a flavon 2 hydroxylate. And this is putting an OH group over there. And what uh, uh, Lorraine and Paula have shown is that, in fact, this intermediate here serves as a perfect substrate for uh, C glycosyl transfer, uh, transferases. Okay, so it is this compound over here, the one that serves as a substrate for the C glycosyl transferases, to be putting that carbon carbon bond. And it is not the uh, abigenine, which would be the flavon itself. And this is really interesting because it's allowing us now to rebuild the entire pathway in a yeast system as well as in vitro. For many years, there have been a group of mutants that have been known in maize that are called someone cells. These are interesting mutants because they don't accumulate uh, um, uh, flavones in the cells, and therefore they're very sensitive to this uh, form yield worm. And um, what we've done in the lab is to again take advantage of this data that we have been learning about uh, P1 in order to see whether we could clone these genes that have been known for over 100 years. And uh, what you can see is that this gene has been mapped. Here's an interval in chromosome 2. It's about 336 genes, and only one of those genes seems to be controlled by P1. Okay? So therefore, it was a very nice candidate for being the enzyme corresponding to um, a PSM2 mutation. And in fact, it turned out to be the case. It is a glycosyl transferase. And uh, Isabel Kass is a PhD student in my lab, originally from Rosari, was able to do um, uh, or develop a very good system that um, um, saves us from having to make transgenic plants to prove complementation. What she does is essentially to create a protoplast out of young seedlings of maize and then transforms this protoplast of any genotype with the transcription factors and the corresponding enzymes. And then we can see directly the complementation in the protoplast system just by following by LCM SMS what compounds are being So by using this uh, the system, what Isabel has been able to show is that UGT4 in fact complements it as a two mutation. There is another mutation that has also been long known for many years, SM1, again in a different chromosome. And in that particular case, we have two possibility genes that are controlled by P1. And using exactly the same approach, Isabel has been able to show that uh, this synthase is capable of doing the complementation. And this was quite surprising, and the results are shown over here, but I'm speeding through because I know that lunch is uh, waiting. <laughs> Just to summarize those findings, um, I told you that UGT4 encodes a ramnosyl transferase. There it makes a lot of sense because one of the uh, main steps is to put a ramnosyl group into this uh, compounds. But the other one was surprising. Uh, but Isabel was able to figure out that in fact it makes sense to have a ramnosynthase during this reaction because the first step that happens in the, fo in the formation of a uh, mason is actually the uh, oxidation of this group over here in the sugar, which is exactly what happens in the formation of a uh, UDC ramnose from UDC glucose. So what we think is happening right now is that this ramnose synthase is capable of using a sugar conjugated to a flavonoid and carrying out this transformation that normally happens when they are hooked up to a UDP, but directly on this compound. Okay, um, I promise I was going to tell you something about the gene center approach, and uh, in this particular case you know the genes, but you have no idea of the regulators. And I have to say that that's mostly what we know today in maize. It's very easy to identify it by synthetic enzymes, by homology. It's really difficult to figure out which transcription factors might be the one doing the control. So what we've done is to use our knowledge uh, that we obtained from CAGE to generate about 175 yeast strains, each one of them harboring a portion of the 1 to 2 kV upstream of the transcription strut site for 136 different phenotropic genes. Okay, so this is a massive collection uh, 175 uh, different uh, <coughs> cells, each one harboring one species of a promoter. And then what we did was to challenge that with the entire collection of transcription factors that we have um, uh, generated as part of the TFO. And the whole idea was to see, okay, from this 2,200 transcription factors, which ones are capable of binding in this very artificial system to which phenolic promoters. And what I'm showing you is preliminary, we've finished with this, and we've done this so far, uh, uh, the results I'm showing you are about two months old right now. We were able to do about 2,000 transcription factors by about 120 um, <coughs> PA promoters were completed, and with that, we identified already over 2,000 new interactions. So, this is giving us a lot of information about possible transcription factors that might be controlling different branches of the phenylpropylene uh, synthesis in maize. Now, the challenge comes to be able to prove which ones of these interactions are really important in the 
Um, again, all that information is present in Gracias. You can order the clones, you can order the strains, whatever you need. So in summary, I think this combination of uh, a gene and transcription factor center approaches are really going to allow us to get, to build a very good gene laboratory grade for men's. Um, we need more data, we need the community to contribute with information so that we can integrate it in the nascent, uh, in the nascent uh, grid. Um, you can identify missing metabolic steps quite easily once you know the transcription factors. So the beauty of the, about this is you know your wave synthetic enzyme, you do use one hybrid, you characterize the transcription factor, and then you use the transcription factor to be able to identify the missing enzymes in the pathway. And that's exactly what I showed you with P1. So it's kind of a circle that will not only give you the knowledge about the regulators, but also the knowledge about the pathway itself. And finally, I think the resources that we're building, which are available to the entire community, should really speed up the pace of research in this area. I just want to finish thanking you all, of course, but thanking the main uh, people in my lab that this, uh, did this work, and in particular Wei Li and Fan Yang, two postdocs that have contributed both to the uh, generation of the promoters and the generation of the k collection. Um, I mentioned already collaboration with uh, Paula and with uh, Lorena, and uh, our funding agencies, uh, USDA, uh, NSF, uh, DNIH, and thank you so much. <laughs>